okay so uh, what i will do in this class is yeah what i'm going to do now is i'll quickly go through uh, maybe an intuitive explanation as well as mentioning the results from the last couple of videos that i have shared with you and then we will go through something uh, for which some of you are uh, waiting eagerly and i was keeping you in the waiting mode uh, that's about how is it uh, in the first place related to any uh, anything with fourier transform so that's what the signal interpretation of it is what we are going to see in this class okay that's what we we start to look at that aspect in this class okay so let me share my screen now along with that let me also mute my video sorry me stop my video okay i'll go to the stop me anywhere something is not clear but if you have not gone through the derivation where you have any questions that you could perhaps first go through that and then come back uh, for any clarifications there okay so let's first uh, yeah uh, hope you are also with your notebook so that you could work along with me uh first let us write the differential equations that we have got for the block equation so hope you all remember that that's equivalent to dm bar by dt equal to you could tell along with me maybe you could uh, give me the lead here if you remember you should be remembering at the end of this course this is a cross product of the m bar with gamma times b bar plus another term uh, yeah that's the the next two terms will be i could write it as minus there so this is the one term okay and then if you look at the free induction decay term a transverse relaxation term that is minus 1 by t2 and uh, that's in the xy plane so you could equally write it as mx times x cap plus my times y cap and then there is a term due to longitudinal relaxation right this has to do with only z cap and uh, mz minus m not the initial value uh, are the m not value final value times z cap right so this we already discussed earlier this is something that causes torque and eventually the precision that you observe is dictated by this term and this term is the free induction decay you call it or this is also due to the transverse relaxation and this is the term which is related to the longitudinal relaxation right this is what we have done in the last zoom class also and uh, then um, we we have this bc uh, all the b bar field here will be always directed towards z cap this is just you gave an ex excitation in the xy plane using b1 coil and you are done with it now whatever field you are applying would be in the z direction only so the case you would be considering here is always if you can call this as x y z your b bar is essentially in the z direction here right and maybe the initial cases that we consider would be the case where you have a constant value throughout for all values of x y z at every point this b bar equal to b not into z cap and then this is your transverse plane right x y plane is referred to as the transverse plane and this is of course your longitudinal axis is this one so you will be looking at values in both the directions but more particularly later we will be more focusing on the transverse plane right um this you refer to this value as m x y and even sometimes you would be simply referring it to as m itself as we move on that's the case in most of the textbooks because that's where you will be receiving the signal and analyzing so that usually referred to as m itself okay then we made 
some initial analysis okay both in the video lecture and the earlier class also suppose there is no t2 decay you consider that case okay and let's say you yeah by the way you represent mxy when you say it that's in fact mx plus j times my so you would be representing the mx and my values as a complex numbers so if you have seen the videos you would already see that this would make your life much easier while representing the values so this is your real axis imaginary axis of a complex number and on the real part real part of this would be of course this mx and imaginary part would give you my so any time you take the real and imaginary parts of this mxy which is a complex number would give you respectively the values of its projections on x and y planes okay now suppose consider this is an m not value okay which is there uh, uh, after you withdraw the b1 value now if you assume that there is no t2 decay what would happen to this m not value okay let me write it as maybe m x y of t in this case what would be that value over time can anyone tell me i am not assuming that there is any decay i am assuming that there is no decay so we would as in the next step we will come to the decay part so what would be the m x y value with this can you tell me the expression or first tell me what would happen then it will go in a circular path correct very good so it keeps rotating here yeah in the in the intuitive explanation i gave in the video there was a mistake that i wrote the here j omega t that should be j times minus j times omega not t because it rotates in the clockwise direction okay this rotation you could figure out from the right hand rule for the cross product okay that's where you would figure out the direction as well so m x y of t would be equal to m not times e bar minus j omega not t okay so next step is what would happen with t2 decay okay there is a t2 decay now this decay is there now assume that you have again this is your mx and here j times my you are having here this is your initial value what would happen now to the initial value will it still rotate with a frequency of omega not radians per second yes yes what will happen to its magnitude now will it remain as m not or something is going to happen to that its amplitude so you would see because of the t2 decay its amplitude would be decaying okay and the decaying factor is given by this t2 constant okay please refer to the derivation where we did it in a very detailed manner so if you want me to write mxy of t would be now its amplitude will be decaying as a function of t2 m not into e power minus t2 okay and of course it is still rotating at j times omega not t is that fine so then of course we have uh, worked out in the recorded video lecture in the similar lines what would be the value of mz of t okay so in fact this value would eventually gain its value to m not then that is dependent on t1 constant so you will get there e power 1 m into 1 minus e to the power of minus t by t1 plus if you have initially mz value of 0 that of course would decay with time okay you could actually combine them and see it in a different uh, perspective also but this is good enough for now okay this is what we have done in the first video lecture and when it came to second video lecture we generalized it the whole expressions to two cases one being you know, here our assumption is that your object is homogeneous so you considered in homogeneous object here that's one further relaxation we made and then we also considered here um, you have spatially varying and time varying magnetic field spatially and time varying magnetic field what is the magnetic field here b okay that's what we have 
considered in the second video lecture. So what did we do there? Say for example, what would be the impact of this? Well, uh, as you move on spatially, the T2 as the object varies, okay? Properties of the object varies. So let me call new vector R bar, okay? The whole spatial thing instead of writing every time X, Y, Z there, let me use R bar there. So now this is a function of R bar. That's what would happen. And what would be the impact of this? This is a more critical one, spatially and varying with the time. So you could call it as dynamic or whatever it is. So what would be the impact of it? So that's what we studied there. Uh, let me again put some steps here. Say for example, B equal to, there is any way B naught plus on top of it, you have a function that varies with spatial location R bar. That means I'm writing equivalent to writing X, Y, Z all there. I'm just writing with one variable and D. This is essentially what we are going to have. And most important thing I was emphasizing in that video as well is that you have this magnetic field in the Z direction only. So if you want to write B as for example, BX, BY, BZ, okay? So this is, these two are always zero, but only this component is there. That is what you are mentioning here, okay? But this distinction has to be clear that this B spatially at different locations, this value is different, but it is always directed in the Z direction. So if this point is not clear to anyone, this is the right time to uh, stop me here and we could have a more clarity there. Okay. So this is your, uh, yeah. Anyone have any question here? So this is the assumption, right? That uh, uh, right now we have the field only in P. No, 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 no. This is not the assumption. See, B is something which you have in your control to apply. Okay. Now you applied one field B1. If you remember this RF field in the XY plane, Okay, just to tip it and then you withdraw it and then there is no other field you are applying. Later you will be applying a gradient field that also in the Z direction. You will, this is under your control. See M bar is not under your control directly, but B is something you are applying and M bar is a result of it. So M bar will have values in X, Y and Z directions, but B which you are applying will always be in the Z direction. But this value you vary based on at which spatial x, y, and z and time values uh, at which locations you are there, you would be going to modify it. So although it's always pointing in the z direction, we are varying the magnitude of it. Exactly. Or to be more precise, I would call it amplitude. Of course, magnitude is also yes, correct amplitude. because anyway, b cannot have negative values. You are right. Except that this yeah, delta b could be negative, the whole could be positive. Okay, suppose if I have some B naught field like this, okay, I might vary something. This could be my delta B that I am adding here. Okay, R bar of T. Assume that this is my B naught of X. So I might be varying only in the direction of X. If you are, if I am doing it, I could add something like this. So I would rather call it amplitude to be just uh, correct. Is okay, sir. sir. Sure. Yes. Sir, uh, sir, do you mean it is rotating only in the XY direction? Uh, what is rotating? See, B is not rotating at all. I mean like uh, B, B is the, the magnetic field you are applying. See, notice here in our whole equation, this M, if you look at it, can have components MX, MY, MZ. But B, we are controlling. And if you go through the lectures and previous classes also, we were always writing even cross product while we are computing. We just keep the Z component there. Okay. The rest BX, BY are always zero there. Mm, yes, sir. Hmm, is that clear? Mm, yes, sir. Good. So this, you have to keep it in mind. Otherwise you are varying gradients and all, then you could confuse it to varying the B value in different directions. Okay, that should not be there. Right. Now, if I am going to write, what would be the associated omega value now? This would be equal to gamma times B. Is it not my omega value? So this is equal to gamma times B naught plus gamma times delta B time of R bar comma T. 
okay this is what we have been calling it as omega naught and now let's call this as delta of omega naught now that's the additional frequency so that you could see now you you have a control to spatially vary this okay then we derived the expression of what would be the m of r bar comma t okay that's the derivation that's done in the last recorded uh, video suppose if you have m not okay first take a look at this all this uh, so additionally you have this field so there is one term coming additionally because of this delta omega not otherwise what would happen this is again uh, if i am not saying anything now in in the current context you assume this is nothing but mxy of r bar comma t because i have my b1 coil there which is receiving this signal okay so this magnitude is varying by minus t by t2 so that's your magnitude and because of this term it would be rotating minus g times gamma times b not or minus j times omega not these are exactly the same expression here right? like this expression only but after that you have this and uh, notice here you have for example in the main equation dm bar by dt and you are computing m okay for that you do integration on both sides so that would give you here an integration of this exponential of gamma times okay r it's it's again it would contribute to omega would contribute to the rotating rotating field just like here okay i could have written here if you want omega not plus here but let me write because the term is a bigger term i'm just writing it separately minus j okay here also it is rotating with the minus j gamma times integral 0 to t delta b of r bar comma tau d tau okay this is the crux of the whole rest of the uh, class so this term has to be clear to you the additional term that has come because of this field see db bar by dt from that you would be uh, dm bar by dt to get m you would be taking integration okay in the whole cross product then what would happen is you could follow the uh, derivations that we did in the last two classes you would realize that uh then it is like integration from 0 to t if you do that that would give you m there while doing that what would happen that would be equivalent to taking integration of this term okay from 0 to t that's what would come and anyway this frequency would make it to rotate at that value it's only is going to change the frequency so that's why there is minus j here just like you have so here if you want i could write it as e power minus j omega kind of term would come okay and now this delta that would eventually delta omega not so integral 0 to t of delta of omega not of this is dependent on time d tau the time i am just keeping it tau because there is upper limit of this integral is also t to avoid that i am keeping tau here because i have used t here is this term clear this is the whole crux of or this is the one from where we proceed okay. further to understand how, what is the signal that you are going to get uh sir yes uh i guess i'm getting a bit confused uh okay. the b value that we have originally written b not plus delta b r comma tau right so here delta b is the corresponding to the rf signal we apply uh no this is correspond to delta b is correspond to the gradient signal that you will be applying okay so the oh. gradient one yeah okay. yeah okay. so this you would be applying in the z direction only that's a very good question if you somebody is confusing with b1 this has nothing to do with b1 this is yeah it's not b1 right nothing at all okay oh, b1 okay. we are done with the b1 once you tip it to the xy plane we forget about b1 okay so so sir the uh, the example which you that is why you yeah. have it in z direction only now okay yeah you are asking something else also yeah so in the video like originally while you were doing the derivation you assumed like it's already been tipped off right correct to the transfer plane so exactly so that tipping off was done due to b1 exactly correct b1 okay we use it only to tip it off that's all okay sir okay mm, very good so any other questions okay good then i hope you all understood that 
now we would consider this is the the key expression okay so that that's why let me write one more time here m of r bar comma t is equal to m not is your magnitude this magnitude is very decaying with the time because it is transverse with t2 this usually would rotate with just the presence of gamma omega b not with e power minus j gamma not now you got the additional field also so there is an additional rotation or a resonant different resonant frequency which varies over time so that delta of that value you know by integrating because you are computing it t so you do it from 0 to t right this delta b which is a function of r bar and time this you integrate or tau that's your we arrived at the final expression by relaxing all the uh, or by removing all the assumptions now okay so after that we are in fact considering some special cases because those are the ones which you would come across uh, in practice while doing uh, many things so one thing is you still consider it's a static field okay that means this is not dependent on your b of r yeah so your uh, b delta b so whatever you are writing here okay so although uh, delta b of r bar comma t is in fact you are assuming it to be varying spatially only but nothing to do with time so that's the first uh, case you are considering and further you are also considering here spatially varying with respect to x only that's the first case we considered in the video so spatially varying with respect to x only okay with a gradient of um, db uh, i could write dbz also there is no problem with that okay i could write as b itself because anyway it has only bz okay dbz by r of t by dt i consider it is varying with uh, sorry this should be this is varying only with respect to x so i could write dx equal to gx in other words i could write here my function delta b of r bar comma t is equal to gx times x okay this is the function i am considering for this particular case where you could think of for a given yz plane this is constant okay for a given x value with x it is varying linearly in other words okay suppose this is my x here okay so this field is varying linearly and that slope is given by this gradient field which you would have under your control okay so then it's very simple you substitute this in the above expression one if i call it in that you substitute so what would you get then this is has nothing to do with the time so but you are uh, integrating with respect to time so you just get t there 0 to t d tau would get this this is nothing but your tau is varying from 0 to t d tau so you would get simply t there so what is your expression there m of r bar comma t equal to m not into e bar minus t by t2 e bar minus j omega not into e bar minus j times gamma times what do i get there gx g subscript x times x times t or you could write the omega value in fact it would rotate with a value of uh you know omega not plus gamma times gx times x okay with that value this is going to rotate that's the first case we considered is that clear so the case 2 we considered is still static magnetic field so static b not value or static b value okay that means you are still b of r bar comma t is only b of r bar but now you are going to vary uh, how you are going to vary is now this has r bar comma t by dx equal to gx okay gradient in x direction is there similarly you have gradient of it in the y direction okay which is gy and also gradient of it in the z direction which you call it zz 
in other words your delta b of r bar comma t will be equal to gx times x plus gy times y plus gz times z again for notational convenience i would write g bar as a vector with gx gy zz then my delta b of r bar comma t is equal to g bar dot g bar dot what r bar right so again you notice here this has nothing to do with this is your delta b of r bar comma t you again substitute here okay so again it has nothing to do with the uh, uh this expression has nothing to do with the time so just gets multiplied with the time so what do you get there as an expression m of r bar comma t is equal to m not into e power minus t by t2 into e power minus j omega not into e power minus j times gamma times what should i write here g bar dot r bar times what what do i get here g bar sorry there is a t here what do i get here times hope at least someone is with me i am not left alone <laughs> times what what do i get here minus j you you look at this expression okay so delta of b of r bar comma d bar i could write it as g bar dot r bar now i need to integrate with respect to uh, tau varying from 0 to t so what do we like get here what is it still missing here t that's it t good that's your expression and the last final case that we have discussed in the last video lecture i'll go there in addition you have here varying magnetic field time varying magnetic field that's all you have time varying magnetic field okay so which i could write it as now how, how could i write then you come here okay so this is a time varying magnetic field so i have to write it uh, um, yeah then this of course is uh, the expression uh you time varying magnetic field is there and also you consider so how do i consider that so delta b of r bar comma t equal to now i have g bar is varying with the time in fact okay that expression gx of t gy of t gz of t those gradient values are varying with respect to time g bar of t dot r bar is what i would have okay so then what would happen is you get a the same expression here but the last one you have to integrate so i will just copy paste it rather than writing from the scratch okay i hope i could do that control c control v okay good so then only this part the last part would be varying there so what would happen here minus j times gamma into okay integral over 0 to tau g bar of t i oh know i should write g bar of tau there is it not because the integral variant i am using is tau here dot r bar okay g bar of tau dot r bar into d tau that's it so you can change the limit to t actually yeah sorry sorry you are right that's t only hmm good that's the expression so that's the again this is from here we start for analyzing our signal so far clear this unless you have gone through the videos you might find it uh, too uh, i think uh, too much of math is there Uh, and you feel like we have gone through it fast but uh, once you go through it this should be more or less if you have not gone through it yet but if the intuition is clear we could go ahead with this you have any quick questions you have any questions here not necessarily quick so how do we get uh, g values 
yeah very good that is what we apply that is what actually we are going to vary in order to decide where we want to have the signal from that's a very crucial part gradients it is we who modify those values okay so we apply this delta b of r, r comma t with the gradient quotes correct correct that's what okay. you not only apply but vary with time in okay. order to have a control over uh, what exactly you want to get out of this okay sir yeah. so what part exactly will this thing affect uh, yeah maybe i th that's what signal equation once i write it this should be clear to you okay sir mm, that's what we will do now if there are no questions we will move on to the signal equation now we will see what is a finally we are going to get the signal unless i have this equation it's very hard to explain what is it we are getting out of the rf coil what is it that you are receiving from the rf coil okay is everybody with me so far if so i'll move on to writing what is the uh, signal we have been waiting for so many days and weeks to see what's the signal you are going to get out of it okay so let me write that now whatever signal you are going to get let's call it as s r of t what would be that is see this is going to by the way just me let me make one more change wherever there is t2 in fact you replace with t2 of r bar there okay because that's a you are considering that your sample is non uniform in, in homogeneous sample so that's what you do it other than that it's not going to change anything okay so now what would be the signal that we would be getting will be entire the or entire the volume of your one if you take all put together that's what would give you the signal m of r bar comma t okay integrated over accumulated see you have put a sample inside you applied this magnetic fields okay at a given location r is xyz at a given xyz location this is what you would be getting you take the whole sum of all things that are there within that sample that should give you the signal s r of t so in other words i could write it as integral or this would be equal to integral over x y integral over z for your whole sample okay the initial value let me call it as m subscript s of x y z that's my initial value which i obtained through b1 okay that into e bar minus t by the whole thing m of r bar comma t will come inside here okay this whole expression would come here t2 of r bar right into e bar minus j times omega not t e bar minus j times gamma into integral over 0 to t okay um, uh, g of tau okay dot uh, yeah anyway g bar am i writing it okay g bar of tau okay if i am writing it as g bar or yeah i think r bar so g bar is fine to write g bar of t dot r bar times d tau right this whole into dx dy dz that's the signal we are going to get now again uh, we could actually by varying the so first case you consider the first case where we considered it is very so your frequency is varying for given every given value of x it is different right in the similar way we will discuss that part again later but for time being you assume that you could excite and get signal from only one slice okay how you do it similar to this you give one frequency only you excite b1 that excites only a given slice and from that you will get it i'll come back to that in uh, in the coming uh, lecture okay but for the time being you make some assumptions here okay first assumption you make it is a uh, constant 2d okay there is only consider only 2d image here okay consider 2d image only so forget about z how you could excite only particular value of z will come to that later okay that's one assumption so second one 
also ignore the value of t2 so when to take the field and what's going to happen for the time being you forget about the way it is uh, making changes to the amplitude okay uh, that this is not very crucial as such because uh, you you will understand it a little later but for the time being you make those assumptions so then look at what is the expression that you are having here sr of t equal to now integral over x integral over y okay then uh, since i am taking only 2d image okay i will call something uh, how do i get here only a particular this would have uh, yeah, will have the resulting um, those voxels which are there for example this is something which is exciting z not minus delta z by 2 to z not plus delta z by 2 okay these are the locations where you get the response uh, this i would make it clear to you in the upcoming class so for the time being you assume that you, what you receive is only you made it in such a way by applying a gradient in the z direction that for a given slice plus r minus delta z by 2 is all you are going to get the uh, value from so m not of x y z into dz that's your m of x y so i am going to write here then this is only a function of uh, function of x and y now okay because i am going to excite dz is taken care here okay into e power minus j times omega not t into okay and exponential of minus j times gamma into i am just re repeating the same expression here 0 to t g bar of tau dot r bar times d tau into dx dy is everybody able to follow with me here any questions here what i have done i just ignoring this amplitude here okay that you could compensate later we will see that later okay it's not a very crucial thing here the, all that is doing is whatever magnitude you are you are getting here that's getting uh, modified that we will see later second thing you up, you assume that you are somehow magically are able to uh, bring into excitation only at a value z not and of course with from delta z in the z before and after so that is giving you instead of m not of x y z you are getting m of x y and the rest i am writing the same expression is that clear to any everybody any questions sai pavan is that clear yes sir okay so then this is where you could actually how do you get rid of this signal i want to get rid of e power minus j omega not t all you need to do is you simply this is your classical communication so you demodulate sr of t okay uh, with e power j omega not t or in other words you write s of t equal to sr of t into e power j omega not t okay that new signal after demodulation okay you all know demodulation right you just need to get rid of this you multiply with that so then let me write my signal as m of x comma y exponential of minus j times gamma 0 to t g bar of t dot r bar sorry this is tau r bar into d tau dx dy clear so far now what i am going to do is see g bar as i was mentioning is under your control suppose if i am applying this as gx into x comma gy into y comma 0 this is the gradient that sorry i should be writing it slightly gx into x is what i would get so i am going to apply a gradient of gx okay that could vary with the time okay gx of tau gy of tau 
zero. So this function still I am not deciding what is the function. It could be a simple linear as I have written there, but that's a function over time. Okay, g x of tau and g y of tau. This you you won't be applying z z component anymore because that you would be using to figure out at what z value you want to get that. So you are going in other words you are going to vary your gradients based on the locations that you are there in x and y as a function of time is it clear so then you substitute then you also write here to new variables kx for example which i would define it as gamma by 2 pi into integral 0 to t gx of tau hopefully you are sensing where i am going now gamma by 2 pi into integral 0 to t gx of tau d tau i am writing it as kx my ky is gamma by 2 pi integral 0 to t g of gy of tau d tau these are my new variables i am defining here now you substitute this here okay g bar of tau is there so what is it that you are getting there your s of t equal to integral over m of xy into exponential of minus j times gamma okay uh, if you want i will write one more intermediate step also g tau into what is this dot product that's equal to g x of tau times r bar is x y z times x plus g y of tau times y into d tau okay this with respect to d x d y okay now i could uh, separate these uh, two integrals here and use gamma by 2 pi into this with k x replace that with this variable similarly gamma by 2 pi into g y of tau d tau you replace that so what is my s of t now can anyone tell me this expression double integral m of x y into exponential of e power minus j 2 pi into what am i getting here k x x yes plus k y y very good did you find the expression you wanted yeah fourier transform of m of x very good this is the two dimensional fourier transform i maybe this is an a yeah, two dimensional fourier transform for just i will write uh, maybe i am not sure how to write f2 or 2d or two dimensional fourier transform let me keep a hyphen so that it will not be um a 2d ctf t i'll write to avoid any confusion two dimensional ctf t of m of x comma y right see now you have control over kx and ky is it not how do you control kx and ky you have a control over gradients of gx of tau and gy of tau you have a control over that and with that of course this is also dependent on time here so as you are taking at different times or by modifying this term at a given time also you have a control over kx and ky and you are capturing the m of xy in the kx ky plane so you have kx ky you vary kx ky you you get a sample and of course you need to demodulate that sample with e power minus j omega na t and then what you are getting are the sum in the sample space of 2d ff 2d ctft you are going to get these values and then how do you get m of xy is simply you take inverse ctft of it okay ctft inverse of it of this function if you take it right that would anyways you won't reconstruct it that way hope you all remember fourier slice theorem to get see this is at a given point you are getting it but you want uh, it to construct in the spatial domain both x and y okay so fourier slice theorem if you have at a regular grid with enough number of samples you should be able to reconstruct the signal back in the spatial domain ct there was an issue with fourier slice theorem because 
by default there uh, with the radon transform you are getting the results uh, acqu acquisitions radially in the fourier domain even if you are moving to the fourier domain but here it is under your control the kx and ky you control them in such a way that you should you could get the acquisitions of this signal you acquire the signal okay at regularly varying kx and ky values and then you simply take use fourier slice theorem to get the signal back in the spatial domain as far as i know this is the only modality okay that's known where the image is acquired where the signal is acquired to be more even more general in the fourier domain and from that you get the spatial domain signal by taking the inverse two dimensional fourier transform is it clear hope you are getting some excitement with seeing this result <laughs> this is a very uh, yeah very classic very elegant result hope this is clear to you guys so i will uh, if i uh, maybe i could if you have any questions i think this, this is where i would stop we had uh, i think uh, yeah, somewhat uh, um, a, a good stretch for your brain muscles so i think i could stop here okay uh, anybody have any questions here before we move further i think the, yeah this is all for uh, this class so if any questions maybe i'll meanwhile pause it so that the video would be yeah uh, so yeah just one minute so, one minute sorry yes yes tell me so uh, what what do we do by controlling kx and ky actually by controlling kx and ky you are figuring out at what values of kx and ky you would like to acquire the signal see this is nothing but whatever signal you are getting is a two dimensional ctft right by controlling kx and ky you are dictating or you are uh, figuring out where you would like to wherever you want to acquire the signal in kx ky space by controlling this kx ky values through these gradients you could acquire signal for that particular values of kx and ky and once you take enough samples of it okay all the fourier uh, analysis that is required has been already covered that that you don't require anything almost more than that you won't uh, you, you would hardly require okay be it sampling and everything you have all those concepts with you now and we using that then what you would do is you take enough values of kx and ky again this you know that it is related to the aliasing part once you do that you have it uh, you then you will be able to get the 2d signal see uh, you have an object in the uh, spatial domain if you have enough samples in the frequency domain without aliasing you would get back the signal so accordingly you would figure out with what spacing of increments of kx and what increments of ky you need to acquire the signal you would accordingly modify them over time by suitably selecting this gx and gy values and then getting that signal here once you change the gradients you put it at the one you want and then you acquire the signal so that would fill samples in the kx ky space and inverse transform of it would give you directly the 2d image is it clear yes sir like to some extent like we are generating the fourier transform and then taking the inverse fourier transform to get m of x y that's right that's right and you are controlling this kx and ky yourself okay so that you would figure out way at what kx and ky the signal corresponds to so but what does this image m of xy represent it's not is it the image that we want to get that's right so uh, in in other words see you are making see this m of xy would vary depending on the tissue that you have there see even when you have a light can you ever see the image as such it's only there you are seeing the reflection how based on the properties of its absorption and other things you are making an inference of what is there at that point so you would always see some property of it getting modified and that's how you would infer what's the object is there 
And here the property that you are inferring here is M of X, Y, which is the magnetization field it is generating, which is dependent on the your applied magnetic field B naught along with that the proton density that you have. So that now you could make a distinction between which kind of soft tissue it is because within the different types of uh, soft tissues could have different proton densities or bone, it's a completely different. So that's how each uh, one with a different proton density would eventually give you different M of X comma Y values. So here the property, uh, so you are inferring this essentially would different uh, kinds of tissue properties, okay? The, the different kinds of materials, okay? Or inhomogeneity if you are considering, that would give you a different uh, uh, response there. From that you would know what is there. Okay, sir. So it is essentially you are saying what is there at that point in other words, you know that if it is a gray matter, this is what I would expect. If it is a white matter, this is the kind of M of X, Y I would expect for these values of excitation times and other things. If it is a bone, this is what I would expect. You know that from that you would infer what is there at that point. It is not the light. This is the magnetic field you are looking at. Okay, sir. Yeah. Mm, good. So any other questions? So this is better than CT scanner, sir, as you don't have to interpolate anymore. No, uh, see, interpolation is just one aspect of it. Uh, you are right. If I am going to use, uh, for example, uh, only Fourier slice theorem, then MR, it is the best case. MR, there is no problem at all with uh, Fourier slice theorem. But in CT, that is not the main bottleneck because you, instead of using slice theorem, we have seen the convolution back, uh, back, what is that? Back projection, right? CBF method we have seen, or filtered back projection. You use this, then there is no question of interpolation. But the issues there are a bit more different, uh, that there, the phenomena you are using is absorption of radiation, gamma rays. That's what you are looking at there, which is having a radiation effect. But certain structures you where you cannot see much of a distinction with M of XY, but perhaps that would certain structures would respond well there. For example, with bones, you get a very good contrast there. So it has its own pros and cons. But the beauty of this is there is no radiation effect. Okay, and you are in uh, this is working in the radio frequency, and you are making uh, use of the abundant hydrogen atoms that we have in our body, be it in fat or in water or in any tissue. That's the key difference. Okay, sir. So also, since we're generating a digital image ultimately, so we can vary K X and K Y only for integral places of X and Y, right? Right. See, even your image is a basically a discrete one, correct? So image is also not a continuous one. So eventually you would be getting a discrete one only. Even after all, an image is 256 by 256 when we say it, it's a discrete one only. Yeah, obviously. Hmm. Any other questions here? Okay, then uh, I'll stop here. Maybe I will take just one or two more classes on MR and I would like to give you, at least uh, take you through some of the segmentation methods. Let's see what best I can do there. Maybe I will not extend it too much. Uh, see, after this, uh, this MR imaging itself could be a complete course in itself, okay? Last time I covered something else uh, where you, what are the kinds of uh, RF pulses you would use and what is that you would be getting and different types of acquisition protocols is what I covered last time. But this time I felt like giving more better appreciation on um, uh, how you get the signal out of it is, is better. So that's what I spent it there. But nevertheless, with this background, now if you want to work in MR imaging or want to become an expert in MR imaging, now you have the kind of platform, the base is ready for you. So you work on it, you take pick any good book there. For example, most of the concepts I have taken from Nishimura textbook, no, is, uh, that's really good textbook, okay? Uh, in the, it, it has a bit high standard, so you will see direct steps there, intermediate steps you need to work out, but the standard of it is pretty good. So you pick a book like Nishimura, 
or even for that matter, uh, uh, the J Prince book also is very good. Signal Medical Imaging Signals and Systems book. That's also is very nice. So you pick one of them and continue your, your reading. And I hope uh, this made clear to you the basics that are required. And you, you now have all the background required also. For example, your DSP background, the, particularly the 2D uh, sampling and all these things and Fourier transforms are very clear to you now. We covered. We have taken enough time in revising and working out, extending them. So I think you could do very well uh, with this given background if you want to further pursue MR. I will not take you through acquisition protocols, but I would. I may take maybe just two more classes. With that, I will wrap up MR imaging and I will give you uh, something, tell you something about segmentation after that. Okay, just let me, with that, I will stop the recording part. <laughs>